All right. Um, well, thanks for that. I think that is a really great overview of the politics that are driving a lot of these decisions, particularly on GMOs. When I come at these issues, um, Kathy mentioned I've been at this for a while, a very long while, and but really most of my focus over the last many years has been trying to bring developing country perspectives into discussions on trade, particularly focusing on issues of food security. When I started looking at this agreement, um, it wasn't so clear to me what the links were. Some colleagues said, well, maybe there'd be something about GSP preferences, preferences for developing countries and harmonizing that. But in the end, I think if we have a focus on food security or food sovereignty, what we're really talking about is how we make decisions about how our food system is governed. And I think many of our colleagues, many of us would agree that the food system we have, especially in the United States, but probably in Europe as well, is broken in many ways. It doesn't give uh, equitable access to fair, to healthy and nutritious foods. We have bad health impacts, uh, growing obesity. And we need to change that food system. And a big part of that will be from innovations that start first on the ground, that start in the States, that start in different places in Europe and build their way up. And so when I look at this agreement and when I've started to focus more on food safety issues, which frankly for me is a somewhat new topic, I look at how those decisions are made and what, what it will mean for the future of our food systems. So. As I said, Alexis mentioned uh, the GMO issue, which in many ways is at the heart of the debate on this agreement. I would like to add a few other issues I think we need to be talking about. Um, one are some emerging technologies in food uh, in which I think the science is advancing, the ability to produce these things is advancing a whole lot faster than any knowledge about what the impacts will be on our bodies or on our environments. I focus especially on nanotechnology in food, but I think there are probably implications for synthetic biology as well. So these new technologies. Um, another are controversial food additives, things like ractopamine, another one of these mouthful kind of words like neonicotinoids, um, which is a food additive, uh, an additive put in pork that is banned in many countries, including the EU, um, but which has already been the subject of tremendous pressure from the US on the EU to lower standards. And then finally, a new issue. Um, in statements we've received from the EU, they've been pretty clear about wanting to open up procurement agreements at all levels in all sectors. Uh, this really raises for us a question about if this could also mean procurement commitments on issues that involve food, say farm to school programs. That's a question mark. We don't know yet. Um, but I think it's an issue we need to be paying attention to. So if we step back to think about how these standards um, get introduced into the trade agreements, how all of this political uh, pressure is made concrete in the context of trade, I would look at sort of three sets of issues. It first, the, or it would be the chapter on sanitary and phytosanitary standards. If you look at most of the bilateral agreements the U.S. is involved with, that chapter is actually relatively short, and for the most part, it points back to uh, the WTO, which has its own chapter on, on those issues. And that, that chapter is guided by a body called Codex Alimentarius, where governments, some of which aren't in the uh, WTO, come together to decide on food safety standards. Uh, there are 180 governments involved at this point, with 110 international NGOs following that. Um, I think some of the issues like ractopamine, this food additive I mentioned, uh, have been hotly debated and are sort of resolved for now. Others uh, on issues such as bovine growth hormone have been up for debate for years, but that body has not been able to make a decision. And with issues on nanotechnology, there have been proposals from Egypt for a few years to at least put a work group together, and not even that has happened. So. Some of these standards sort of percolate at Codex and then make their way up to, to WTO, which would then feed into the trade agreements, um, but certainly not without the political pressure that we've heard about. I think there are other mechanisms that we could imagine could get introduced into this agreement. Uh, in the TPP talks, there's been a proposal for a rapid response mechanism uh, that would require governments uh, to report when, when they stop food at the border for food safety reasons very rapidly and to make decisions in a matter of weeks. 
So in some cases on issues where probably standards are, are in question, the competing standards. Um, what's concerning about that proposal, uh, besides the fact that it, it's such rapid pressure, is the second part of it is to make those decisions subject to binding dispute resolution. So this is a proposal that is on the table in the TPP. I think we could imagine it could become an issue in these negotiations as well and is something we need to be focused on. And then finally, um, looking at how these, this political pressure becomes made concrete, some of the agreements will also include side letters that are in the text of the agreement. The U.S.-Peru agreement, for example, has a side letter on meat safety standards, uh, which is about recognizing U.S. Uh, standards as equivalent to the Peruvian standards and allowing for imports of, uh, of beef, which were suspended before because of concerns about mad cow disease. So I think if we look at, if we're paying attention to where these issues could come out, uh, I would say those would be the three places uh, in the food safety standards. I've mentioned nanotech. That may be an issue people haven't even heard of. Um, it is, I think, kind of a frightening development. And it's something that could become a huge part of our food system. The Grocery Manufacturers Association has estimated that nanotech-enabled um, food coatings and um, packaging could be 25% of the $100 million market over the next few years. Um, it's not clear uh, how much is already in our food system. There are, there are nanotech-enabled sunscreens that are out there. Um, and just to be clear, the scale we're talking about there is still a lot of issues about definition, but for the most part, these engineered nanoparticles are between one and 300 nanometers. A human hair is 80,000 to 100,000 nanometers. So this, the extremely small size means that they operate differently than other particles. So I've listed here a few cases of products that we do know uh, are already being commercialized. Um, as you saw, an NGO has been testing uh, different foods and found uh, titanium dioxide, which I guess makes powdered donuts whiter, um, which makes me a little less wanting to eat those in the future. Um, I looked at uh, the Wilson Center's project on emerging nanotechnologies, that they have an interesting database of products being commercialized with nanotech, um, which include the two I've listed here. And then um, a comment there that most of the growth uh, has been happening in the US and Europe. So these are going to be, these are both very uh, involved actors in advancing this new technology. Um, there is still very little information about exactly how, how these particles will interact with our bodies. It is pretty clear that they can pass through cell walls, that they can enter into bloodstreams. There was some research in China that indicated um, that nanoparticles in a study on mice uh, could affect changes in DNA. Uh, in, in our environment, when those particles become used, say, in, um, for pesticides or different things, it can affect the flora and fauna in the soil. This is all very tentative um, data that's emerging, but I think the alarming thing is the data on the impacts is coming out so much more slowly than apparently the products that are being commercialized. So, we get to the way we should be handling these kinds of issues where we should be making decisions about how, what foods are safe to be in our market. Europe's, um, rely, we've mentioned, relies on the precautionary principle. This is not just, this is something that is in the Treaty of Lisbon, in their founding document. So it permeates a lot of EU law, and it's, it's a very basic principle that I think is unfortunate isn't in our system. It isn't totally ignored. Um, in fact, as I was trying to find examples of where the precautionary principle is used, I was surprised to see that President Reagan approved a treaty, uh, the Montreal Protocol on Substances that Deplete the Ozone Layer, uh, that included the precautionary principle. It's a principle in the Convention on Biodiversity and a founding principle in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. All uh, treaties that the U.S. has either ratified or is deeply involved in negotiating. So this is not a foreign principle. Um, and in a, if I was being more optimistic, I might even think that we would end up uh, accepting the precautionary principle here. I don't, um, but at least not at this point. Um, but I think this is one of the big issues that's at stake. And I think there is also 
it's important to recognize there's a huge amount of political momentum in support of that principle in the European Union. So I think this will be a big sticking point in the talks. So if we think about how we might get to different kinds of decisions about our food system, decisions that are healthier, there are different ways that can ha that can happen. Uh, FDA is the agency that, that makes most of those decisions. On the issue of nanotechnology, I think one hopeful sign, um, over in the last year, they, they acknowledge that those particles cannot be counted as generally recognized as safe. Uh, the industry was arguing that a nanoparticle of, say, silver was the same as a macro particle. And in fact, um, for many reasons, it's not. And finally, F FDA has admitted that, although they're still trying to wrestle with exactly how you regulate that. I think it, it's an issue in Europe as well, where they have different processes underway, some of which that have been underway since uh, 2006, to try and figure this issue out. This is a, the, the issue with the nanoparticles is both the size and the shape, mean that they operate just so very differently. Um, and again, points us back to, in a case like this, I think we can all see that it's, it's kind of alarming to think about these things being in our food that are not visible, that are not detectable for the most part. Um, we need to be sure that they're safe before they get in our food system. So a second category I think we would, that would come up in the trade talks uh, will be about food additives that for the most part are much more accepted in this country than in Europe. Um, bovine growth hormone is one of them. Chlorine rinses for poultry, as someone mentioned, rinsing off the stuff um, that, that's still on the chicken before it gets to the plate. Um, this has been the subject of, several, of trade pressure. And then this uh, chemical ractopamine, which is a failed asthma drug that is used to produce lean uh, meat in pork for the most part. Uh, it has, it's banned in many countries, including the European Union and China, um, because in part because it produces so many more sick animals. So those sick animals are possibly getting into our food systems and concerns about impacts on public health. Um, some, the Danish pork industry, I think, is an interesting example in Europe of an industry that is very profit motiv motivated but has found ways to produce this pork without using that additive and still make a tidy profit. And um, as I said, it, it's kind of interesting that China, which is not a country we often think about for high food safety standards, has actually banned this chemical. Oh, and um, when we think about uh, the recent Smithfield acquisition. In fact, all of the pork that Smithfield will be sending to China will be ractopamine free. Um, so it is possible to do that at a reasonable price. And then I guess a, a last set of issues is the one that's a big question mark. Uh, this issue about whether local foods programs could be included in the procurement commitments in the trade agreement. So far, to be fair, as far as I can tell, the U.S. has not included food programs in procurement commitments. But I think it's interesting the way the EU keeps repeating over and over all sectors, all levels, and there hasn't been any response about what's off the table. Um, I think you know there is potential uh, for this to include things like farm to school programs. Uh, colleagues of mine in Minneapolis pointed out work they're doing with local hospitals uh, to ensure that locally, which include procurement preferences for locally grown foods. Uh, these are decisions that communities are making about how, how their food is grown, what their food system will be, and we don't need to preempt that through a trade agreement. So for me, a happy outcome of this week of negotiations might be for the EU to say, no, we didn't mean that, um, and at least take that off the table. But certainly it's an issue in other sectors as well. And then finally, an issue that has started to come up in other talks as well. In a lot of ways, uh, what's, it, what's being negotiated in this agreement and in the Trans-Pacific Partnership is a kind of end run around the global rules process that we have at the WTO and in other UN frameworks. Uh, what will be developed here will change the standards. It will become the new normal of what's acceptable in trade commitments. So it's important uh, that we engage in this talk just as much as the major campaigns that have been launched against um, some of our happy victories and some of, that are still ongoing. So thanks very much. Thank you to Karen and to Alexis. And um, I just wanted to make one point 
that Karen made about when she mentioned the uh, term of um, generally regarded as safe or grass standards. That's kind of is an example where as weak as our regulatory system is, it has taken positions on some really important issues. And that's actually an issue that for an item, a product that's really of concern to dairy farmers is something called milk protein concentrate, which is used as a substitute for dairy product um, here in the U.S. in many processed products. And one of the concerns is that it never had a review. It never, it never went through the, the, the grass standard and it's basically coming in, being imported in processed foods. There's International Dairy Foods Association. There's a lot of different entities that are really looking out for their ability to move products globally and move products in and out of grocery stores and in and out of different chains internationally. And, you know, just as Karen mentioned, the um, current purchase of Smithfield by a large Chinese um, company, we also have um, supermarket chains, Giant Food, which is based around here in the Washington area, and Stop and Shop and others are owned by the Ahold Corporation, which is based, you know, in, in Europe. And so there's a lot of international activity already happening in the food system, and there's a real um, agenda to try and quote, harmonize, but reduce what, what can be moved across borders and, and through, through the um, distribution chain. And what's also at stake is who's actually raising and producing those products, whether it's farmers um, who are trying to be independent to recover their real costs of production, whether in Europe or here in the U.S., or farmers under what we would view as very unfair contracts by a company like Smithfield, of which there's major questions of what will happen down the road, um, wherever they may be contracting. So these issues, I mean, we've known for a long time, but we feel it's even clearer now that food farm issues um, overlap into a lot of the other areas that are being discussed um, throughout the trade agreements. And it's up to us to start questioning those issues and making some of those connections.